Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Adherent First and 15. Today, our guest is uh, Dr. Hesham Saleh, which is one of the consultants from the Imperial College, which uh, is uh, basically doing his uh, main activities in different uh, hospital in the London area. Um, good morning, Dr. Hesham. Morning. Um, or good afternoon. Depends where you are. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, uh, I have uh, an amazing uh, period of my time with uh, uh, Dr. Hesham Saleh from, uh, from in 2015. Uh, we spent the time together in, uh, at the Charing Cross Hospital where he is uh, his uh, consultant. And he's also spending his time at the Brompton Hospital, which is, uh, um, which is uh, taking care of a patient with, uh, with uh, cystic fibrosis uh, and uh, autoimmune uh, diseases. But today, the talk of um, Dr. Hesham is going to be the assessment, the patient assessment for rhinoplasty. So uh, I just want to, to uh, let you start with your talk, please. Thank you very much, Puya. Thank you. So hello, everybody. Uh, I like to give this lecture because I think it's the most important thing uh, to think about when you plan to do rhinoplasty, or especially rhino uh, rhinoplasty, how to assess the patient. If you can see the photo here, this is Charing Cross Hospital in London. That's where I am now. I'm sitting about here. So the sunny day, it looks like this from outside as well. If you are interested to read about assessment in rhinoplasty, you can go online and you find the EMT Masterclass Journal. You can see in the, in the, on the slide. And this is free. It's available, the whole article about this. It was published in 2014. If you have the book of Scott Brown, Otolaryngology, which is a textbook in England, we have an updated chapter in this. And that's just been published. Now, I have a lot of patients in this uh, lecture, so please don't take pictures of the patients. You can take photos of anything else. The patients consented for me to use them as a lecture, but not to be uh, distributed around. If you're okay with that, we'll go ahead. So, when I talk about assessment of rhinoplasty, I put three analyses. Why is that? Analysis, analysis. Number one, analysis of the patient themselves means psychology of the patient not just the nose. And then you look at the face of the patient and then you look at the nose itself. So I'm gonna talk about the patient in detail a little bit because the most important thing is to decide is that patient suitable to have a rhinoplasty or not. So this is an old graph created by Gorney, who was a plastic surgeon, which shows two colors. The red one is the bad one, the green one is a good area. If you have a patient with very high concern, so they're very upset and worried about the nose, even if the nose has a pr small problem, this is a patient that you don't want to do. If you have a patient that has a deformity and are unhappy with that, clear, then that's a good patient. So the patient is too obsessed, it's not the right one. So the patient should understand the deformity and has realistic expectations. There's lots of studies showing that poor results are based on emotion and dissatisfaction than technical failure. So we've done a good operation, but the patient is not happy because they expected something different. That's why you have to reach a, an agreement and understanding that the patient knows what to expect. I use this diagram in my consultation with the patient. I'll tell them if you have four grades or five grades of rhinoplasty, the nose is the worst here and five is the best. When you change your nose, you can jump one grade, like two to three, like here. You can't usually jump two to four. You can be lucky if this happens and it's impossible to jump and create a completely new nose. That's a very useful something to show the patients. There is a standard ideal patient, which has been used a lot, Sylvia. Sylvia is a patient who usually a lady, secure, young, listens, verbal, intelligent, attractive. She knows what she wants, like this lady. She knows it's deviated here, a bit wide. She wants to be straight and narrow, and the tip is better. When you create that, she's happy. So that's the kind of patient who's ideal. They expect a result. They don't expect ideal, perfect result, and they know what to, uh, they want, Sylvia. The not ideal patient, a lot of them are male, the difficult patient, Simon. Simon, single, immature, male, overly expected, narcissistic. These patients, they're obsessed with the nose, they don't know what they want, and so on. And you can see it in the consultation. A big, big example about this was, we kept having operation, 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 because he was never happy. They don't know what they want, and the nose ended up very scarred. An example of this patient, this is a patient of mine. He wanted to be uh, looking like that football. And this is all he wanted. I want the nose like this. See, it's something that is not ideal about this. So you really have to be care careful with this patient and assess them more. Another patient, who, uh, a male patient, who wants to look like this lady, uh, uh, 
have the same eyes as the hair, I want her nose. This is unrealistic expectation. So you have to be aware of these patients. Then a lot of patients will write you notes and send you lots of diagrams. I want to look like this actress, Rita Hayworth, or uh, Eva Gardner, sorry, from 1950s movie and descriptions what they want. They have too much idea. They're obsessed. These patients will never be happy. The worst ones that uh, the patient actually get will give you diagrams of the techniques they want to use. And these patients are the very one obsessed uh, with the nose. They keep researching, 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 and they think they understand the technique that they want to use. They have a psychological problem. They have body or obsessive personality. And these patients are always difficult to please, and you have to avoid them or send them to psychologists. Here's another example of patient writing diagrams and saying various things about the nose and around the nose, forehead is numb, all these things, which also is uh, unrealistic here. This is a funny one example of a patient who sent to me. Uh, the, the general practitioner sent the letter. She has swollen nose. She needs an operation. She used to think she's a Nefertiti, the queen of Egypt. So clearly the patient had delusion or delusions of grandeur and other psychological problems. These patients are to avoid. You have to ask psychologists to look after them. The commonest diagnosis you get from these patients is body dysmorphic disorder. These are the patients who actually you want to avoid, and I'll show you in a minute. There's lots of other problems with this disorder, delusion disorder, alcohol dependence, mild depression. These are not the major ones. But body dysmorphic disorder is the one you want to avoid, and it's commoner than you think. The Italian psychologist, uh, sort of psychiatrist, Morselli in 1891, described the condition of body dysmorphic disorder which is subjective feeling of ugliness or physical defect, which the patient feels themselves and they feel is not similar to others, although appearance is normal. So the patient is normal, but they think there's something wrong with them. And this is existent in 20% of the patients who come to rhinoplasty. So it is common. That's why I have to avoid it. Last year I was in Rome. I met Dr. Morselli. Obviously he's not the same one. and grand grandson of the psychiatrist, Dr. Morselli, who described body dysmorphia. He's now a plastic surgeon in Rome. He also writes a lot of books on body dysmorphia expert. Uh, the body dysmorphia has been recognized in the media everywhere. And this is from England, from the BBC. But this lady was, had a TV program about her. She used to take 300 selfies per day and delete them. And she can't get out because she thinks she's ugly and that her nose is horrible. And she's upset with her appearance. So that's a typical body dysmorphia, which is curable by the psychiatrist. Uh, this is an example of a psychiatrist who has specialized. This is Dr. David Veal. He published a lot, and this is a psychiatrist I often send my patients to. So there's a high-risk group of patients that you have to be aware of and avoid to operate on and, uh, when you're assessing your patient, which, number one, is the body dysmorphia. Number two, patient who demands too much from you, like, I want to have the operation now or next week. You usually expect too much. You don't want that patient. They have to have take it easy. Uh, the patient who insists on secrecy, that nobody wants to know about the operation and so on. Big rhinoplasty is a big operation, and the patient needs psychological support, relatives, and so on. These patients are going to be stressed. You want to make sure that they, you don't operate on anybody who really doesn't want anybody at all to know. The surgeholics means the patient had multiple operations. You get a patient who had four, five, six operations, and the nose doesn't look too bad. You have to be worried about this. Don't think you are the surgeon who's going to correct it. A lot of these surgeholic patients are the ones who have body dysmorphia. They keep going back and back and back. So be careful with these ones. As I said earlier, obsessive or perfectionist, the ones who are write you notes and send you lots of diagrams by the millimeter are the patient who will never be going to be pleased because you can't make a nose in perfection of millimeters, half millimeters. It's a body, it's a human tissue that heals in its own way sometimes. It's unpredictable a little bit, so you have to explain that. You don't want a patient who are impolite. A lot of the time you get patients who are really horrible to your staff, they're nice to you, but they they may be not nice to you later on if they're not happy. You have to avoid this. You need to have to like the patient when you operate on them. And finally, the opposite one is a flattering one. It's too nice to you. You say that you're the best. You're the only one in the world that can do it. They expect too much from you. They're probably perfectionists as well. And you have to explain to them, yes, I have good results. I've done all this, all these years. I have experience. But nobody is perfect. You can't get the results that sometimes are unpredictable. You have to explain to the patients. Yeah. If you're not sure about any of these patients, if you sit in the clinic and see a patient that you're not sure about, involve a psychologist and psychiatrist, tell the patient in a nice way, and they may see the psychologist, especially if you think they have body dysmorphia. Okay, how about uh, screening? Screening. There's lots of now uh, screening, but it's not accurate enough, but there are good screening tools I can use. This was paper published about the screening tools, but there are two good screening tools. Uh, this paper to, we published from my unit and another unit in Royal National ENT Hospital to see how many people have body dysmorphia. 
And as I said to you earlier, we gave the questionnaire, as I said to you, we found 20% have proper uh, body dysmorphia and they should not have operations. Of, yeah, so that's, you don't want to do that. Interestingly, the control group had 4% positive. So the population everywhere, 4% of them have body dysmorphia disorder. So it's common. But the ones who come from rhinoplasty, 20%. The questionnaires to use are two if you want to exclude dysmorphia. The Utrecht questionnaire, you can get this on the internet. Uh, this is a, a, a sub, uh, five questions you give to the patient. And if you get high score here, they can have body dysmorphia. Then you can refer them to psychiatrists. The one I use is the one from uh, Belgium, the body dysmorphia disorder, aesthetic rhinoplasty, a new screening tool by Peter Hellings and Likakis. And this is the one I use, it has seven questions. You can download it from internet as well. Good. Now, a lot to talk about psychology because it's important now we talk about the nose and the face itself. You have to stand the facial aesthetics, the balance of the face and symmetry. This is from ancient Egypt. This face is too symmetric, it's not realistic. In reality, most people have asymmetry. Leonardo da Vinci created these measures, which are the ones we use now. Divided the face into vertical fifth. We start at the ear, lateral canthus, medial canthus, medial canthus again. So they should be almost symmetric, but not 100%. And if you, if you do this uh, horizontal ones from a chin, nasal labial angle, root of the nose, and hairline, third, third, third. Nobody has exactly a symmetric face, so you'll have slight variations. If the variation is too big, then the face is obviously asymmetric. But 99% of patients or people have slight asymmetry, which is normal. But severe asymmetry is important because you will see it like this. This patient, if you look at his right side, is bigger than the left side. I'll tell you why it's important. We published a few papers on this. Let's divide that face into two. Here's the right side, here's the left. Then we get a mirror from this one. This is the right side, a mirror from the left side. Okay, now we have two parts of the face. Then join these two, two rights, two different people because his face is completely asymmetric. The problem with these patients is if you have asymmetry, the nose will give you an illusion is deviated or asymmetric and you have to explain to the patient. So illusion of twisted nose and if severe, you do rhinoplasty, you never make it straight, the patient will always come back and say to you, there's still something wrong. So when you see asymmetric face like this, explain to the patient not to expect perfect straightness because it's impossible. Now, the nose, okay? Now, you get to the nose, you wanna look at the nose properly. There are inspection, yeah, which means that you have to look at the nose clearly, you, like everything else, you just examine the nose first, and it's important to palpate because you feel how strong the cartilage or any deficiency, and then you take photographs. I take photographs in my clinic, and then you plan your surgery after you've done all this. Now, we're gonna talk about inspection. So on inspection, I look at seven areas in the nose. We'll list them now for you. The skin, thick skin, yeah, deviations of a nose, length of the nose, I'll show everyone the separate projection of a tip, dorsum, tip itself, and then the base, ailer base. Seven things, tick, 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 you can do it. it. Takes you two minutes in the clinic. Skin. Thin skin and thick skin are very different. If you have thick skin, you cannot achieve a small nose. So you have to explain that to the patient, you have to understand that. And it doesn't shrink that well. So you have not you're not gonna create a very refined nose. You can make it smaller, but not too small. Thin skin can let you do this, but if you created any irregularity underneath, it will show, like you, should, you see in that patient. So you have to be aware of this and explain, explain to the patient. Deviation of the nose is very common to see deviated noses, and it's nice to be able to divide it into three thirds like this. Upper third is bone, middle third is cartilage, or the upper lateral and septum, and lower third is the lower lateral cartilage and the rest of the septum. And when you decide, uh, you say, deviation, right, left, left, and so on. That helps you to plan your operation, like this. So this lady here, left, left, left. This chap here, right, right, central. Le right, sorry, central, right, right, okay? That is give you an idea when you plan your surgery, what you're gonna do uh, uh, when you write your nose. Then talk about the length of the nose. What's the length of the nose? Length of the nose is from here to here, from this radix to radix to the tip, okay? And a lot of patients will say to you, doctor, my nose is long. How to know if the nose is long or not? Sometimes you can tell by just looking, but the easy way is this, tomium to mentum. So that's between the lips to the chin here, should be equal to the length of the tip here. That's the simplest thing you could do, because you just sometimes just put your fingers like this. That's equal or longer, or just measure with the ruler. Yeah, if you want the very accurate measure, uh, is this one here, 1 1.6 multiplied by tip to tomium. That should be the length of the nose. So that's one important thing that you can do quickly in the clinic. 
And then the projection of the tip. A lot of patients would say, my tip is too long, doctor. Here we are. This is definitely too long, but sometimes the patient comes to you and it's not very obvious. Then you can think about this good, uh, good low R good or good uh, equation, which is very easy to measure as well. So you, multi, you, you measure the nose to tip here and tip to alar groove. And you divide this by this and you get that number. If you get 0 0.55 to 0 0.6, that's normal. This patient will measure it and 0 0.88 because he's over projected. If it's projected, it's less than that one. So you could use that on a facial photograph sometimes if you have to show you the projection. There's so many angles and all that which nobody uses in real life, but these are being measured to detect the projection and chin and all that, like nasofrontal, nasofacial, nasomental, uh, and mentocervical are for academic research and so on, and not many people use it in real life. There's a simple thing about the relationship of the lip and chin as well, because some patients will have small or large chin. Most people will have a line going through upper and lower lip like this and then go through the chin. Because the lower lip, a lot of the time, is two millimeter behind the upper lip. It doesn't apply to everybody, but most people have that. So if somebody said to you, my chin is, if the line goes through like this, it's not big. But if the line goes inside the chin, yes, it is big. If the line goes in front of the chin, it's small. Why are we talking about the chin? Because the chin, if it's small, gives the illusion of a big nose. So sometimes we have to put chin implants, for example. I'll show you later. I was just saying, here, here we are. So this patient before rhinoplasty, the line is not going through the chin. It's got a small chin. So we put a chin implant and the rhinoplasty, she gets a more balanced profile. Now the dorsum. It's very important to look at the dorsum because it it's, gives you the appearance of that nose. And this brow tip line, there's a shadow that you see in nice straight noses, gives that appearance of beauty, in, especially in women here. So it's a shadow. Uh, from the eyebrow like this to the tip, lateral aesthetic line. You can see it in that lady here. It's nice to have that line. That line is broken like in this patient I showed you earlier. You don't see the line because she has a deviated nose. You can see the shadow here already, yeah, after we straighten the nose, and that gives her nose a, a balanced appearance. Lateral aesthetic line. If we look at the dorsum from the profile view as well. It should not be low in men. It should be straight like this, even slightly high. It's okay for women to be a bit low, but not too low, like this, one to two millimeter below the straight. Don't want a man to have a low dorsum like this because it'd be feminine. Then the tip. Tip is quite complex. You look at a few things, but it is the lower lateral cartilage that make the tip. So you want to look at them. You can see them under the skin sometimes here. The tip, defi tip defining point are the shiny light here. And then there are other four defining four, so four in total. One here, which is a super tip, you see like a shadow, and one here, infra tip. So look at this, any irregularity or asymmetry. Then look at the size of the cartilage. This is what is big here. Look shape, this is square, boxy. Look asymmetries, a little bit here maybe. Bifidity means the space between the lower lateral cartilages here. And rotation of the tip, up or down, which you look on the profile. I'll show you in a second. There are so many names for tips, but it's not important to remember them. But this is boxy because it's like a box. Here is bifidity, there's so much here. Bulbous, like a ball. Amorphous, there's no tip because the skin is so, so thick you can't see where the tip is. And this is the nasolabial angle, the rotation of the tip, which in men should be 90 degrees because uh, that's, that's uh, male, 90 to 95. In women, it should be more open, goes up like that, 95 to 105. Then you also look at the columella show. A lot of patients say, I don't like what it's showing here. It should be maximum five millimeter. It's the distance. If you take a line from anterior vestibule, a line from posterior vestibule, it's between them. So average should be four, five is, a, is the highest possible. And here's male and female. It's just nasal frontal angle. You see the difference here, which is not as important as this. 95 degree to 105 in women, open to the nose is rotated up. In men should be 90 to 95. He's 95. Finally is the alar base. So alar base is the, is the distance from here, from the base to the base. And a lot of patients come to you and say, my, this is why a doctor. The simplest way to measure it, you can just measure, it should be, this should be 80% of this. So that dorsum should be 80%. But the easiest or best is intercancel distance here should be equal. If the alar base is much bigger than this, then it's wide. So that's the way to explain it to the patient as well. When you look at the alar base from below, if it's balanced, especially in Caucasian noses, you'll find that if you buy a line that goes through the columella in the middle here, where this diversion is, be half, half. 
if you can't make a line in the anterior vestibule here, it should be that third and two thirds. And the shape is a triangle, that's in Caucasian noses. But if you look at other ethnicities, completely different. So ALA base applies to this, not to this. So you've done the outside of the nose, you want to examine the inside, you want to make sure the septum is straight, it's not very deviated, the turbinates are not very inflamed, the nasal valve is not blocked, uh, not blocking, I'll show you the valve in a second. There's no collapse when the patient breathes in. So these are things that we look at the patient's there. We're still inspecting. So here is the lady. Uh, so she's breathing, yeah? She's not collapsing. I didn't ask her to do anything. That's the valve. Septum, upper lateral, terminate. It's a cross-sectional area here, which is there. It's the narrowest part of the nose. If this is narrow, or this is weak, the nose will collapse. When you look at the patient breathing normally and no collapse, that's good. But if you have a patient like this, that's not normal. I ask her to breathe deeply. So everybody will collapse when you ask them to breathe deeply. So don't ask the patient to breathe deeply. Just watch them breathing, okay? Because then they will collapse if it's abnormal. But if you ask them to breathe deeply, it's not right because they will collapse anyway. So that's one important thing to look at. And then now we're starting the palpation. As I said earlier, you need to feel, feel the skin, how thick it is, feel irregularities underneath that the patient had right past it before. Tip record, you push it in, if it goes in and comes back very slowly, it means there's no cartilage inside, like a box or what. So you know that you need cartilage grafting when you operate for something. Feel the cartilage, the ALA cartilage here, are it strong or weak? And also feel the spine of the septum. Just push it here to see if it's strong or is it collapsed or is it deficient. In patients who had surgery before or abscess and so on, that can happen. Photography is essential when you do a rhinoplasty. I take photographs. I take them myself in my clinic. Uh, if you're in a big hospital, they will take them for you. If you're a professional photographer, but I like taking them myself because I use them during a consultation. I show the patient, tell me the bits you don't like. And also when you actually plan your operation, you have to use them and look at them. During the operation itself, you have them to plan and look. And also when you finish, when you look at the patients again, when they come back to see you, you want to assess your results. And it's very important because you learn from your results and you look and compare before and after. Medical legally, it, it's a requirement in the UK and should be everywhere else to have these pictures because it's a document. It's like a hearing test. It's like an x-ray. Uh, this is your test in the patient who's having photograph, uh, rhinoplasty. You cannot do, uh, for example, a sinus operation without a CT scan. You cannot do a rhinoplasty without photographs. There's standards guidelines for the photographs, which is available on the, the photograph should be uh, balanced on the Frankfurt line, which goes from the tragus here and from the margin, it means the nose, the head is not tilted sideways or front to back, and that will make the head balance, and then you do all these views. National guidelines of rhinoplasty, etc. photography, Institute of Medical Illustrator. This is free online. You can download it if you look. You found this. There's a link here, but just put Institute of Medical Illustrators. You'll find it if you don't want it. And that's an English website, but it's free. You can tell, you can learn how to do photography with patients. But this is it. We have all these views. Front is the essential one, then the laterals, right and left, and then the obliques, right oblique, left oblique, and then below. So these are the standard one, the basal one. You can have more views like the, the, the close up, like this. Or you can have views from the top, which are useful for deviated noses because you can see the deviations. And also you can have views, uh, two type views, a normal basal one, only see the base, and base radix, when you see the whole of the dorsum and the base. This is very useful as well. Uh, bird's eye view is not done that lot, a lot, and it's not as useful as uh, Some people do it, but I don't do it routinely. I like this view better. Then, uh, we like to use computer imaging. A lot of surgeons nowadays use it, and um, it's very useful. What do you do with this? You put the pictures on the, on the computer, and you manipulate it to change the appearance. Like this patient, for example, she has a bump. She doesn't like it, but she has a small chin. She doesn't realize that it's a small chin. So then we're going to change the nose and the chin to show her what it should be before and after like that. And then she knows the appearance, or she expects what it could the appearance be if she does that. So she understands that she needs a chin implant and uh, reduces the hump at the same time. So it's very useful to assess that with the patient. There's so many softwares from expensive to cheap. This is the most complex one from the States. This one is used. Uh, but you can actually get reasonable software like this one from the iPhone, which can do things not enough, but you can start with it. Uh, you want a professional one, these last two are the best, and this one is good as well. 
Now there's a 3D software. I'm playing with the software here. I don't know why it's not moving. So this is a software for 3D photography, which is coming now. It's a bit, still a bit expensive and is in development. Some surgeons have started using it already. Normally it moves around. You can see like a face in the 3D, but the video doesn't like to work here. It doesn't matter, but it's a 3D photography. You take a photograph 30 degrees around the face and you can move it around and you can manipulate the face as well. Sorry, my slide is done. Okay. So there's lots of studies show that computer imaging is very useful in communication with the patient and you can understand what the patient expects. So you can expect, see the patient who expects too much. You can tell from that that patient is not realistic. Uh, you have to remember that you should not be detached from what the, the software can do and you can do a real operation. So don't give them the best look he knows that you don't think you can, you can, you can actually do it in reality. So you have to be careful with this. And also explain to the patient, these are just images. They not, do not represent the nose in real life. It's just approximation, just guidelines. Image manipulation is a means of communication, does not imply a specific guaranteed outcome. So otherwise the patient would think exactly that the nose will look like that. So finally, finally now, it's essential to document everything when, you, when you're planning a rhinoplasty because you spend enough time in that consultation with the patient and everything is there in your mind, you plan it there. Write your notes. There's lots of drawing sheets that you can take what you're going to plan or the abnormalities. There's gun to diagrams or computer, computerized diagrams you can use as well. And then write your surgical plan and explain everything about the operation with possible complications when you're with them and write them down. This is an example of diagrams you can uh, plan, turn it, tick, 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 you can tell the abnormalities and you can write your surgical plan as well here. Uh, this is Gilbert Knowles Trinity, which is also available online. You can download. And this is the Gunter diagrams, which is software that you have to buy. And that is for surgery. You tick, it will show you what you've done. So, to conclude, anal analysis, analysis. And remember, patient, face, nose, and inspect the nose, palpate the nose, photo review, and then you're planning with the details and diagrams and all that. All done. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, this is this was very very schematic, very uh, very well done, because uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it's uh, covered the whole thing that should be done for a, a right and a proper assessment for uh, um, for the patients that want to do a rhino plastic. Uh, we do have a few questions from, uh, from the audience, which are uh, from different places as well. One is from uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, our colleagues uh, are asking, uh, what's uh, the assessment for uh, a revision surgery? It's very simple. You just have to be aware more uh, of the psychological impact of the patient coming for a secondary operation because they're very upset already had one operation. Uh, and ideally, if you have not operated on the patient yourself, you ask for the operation notes because you need to know what was done before. You need to know if you have grafts done, what exactly is there, septoplasty, and so on. And emphasize on the palpation here because you can feel the grafts if you palpate, especially in the doors, if there's any grafts, you can feel them. So palpation is very important here. But the most important thing about the secondary patient is psychological impact. Should uh, they be really upset, and they can't expect the best results from a secondary operation as well because it's already done once. So you have to explain everything to them clearly and examine them properly and get the operation notes from what was done before. The, the same, uh, the same um, colleague is asking: uh, Would you uh, suggest the imaging before uh, the revision surgery? Yeah, um, you mean imaging like photographs or? No, no, no. He's asking for like CT scan or MRI. Only if you suspect something in, this, in the sinuses and so on. I don't think uh, the imaging is better than the examination with the endoscope for the septum, for example, or the valve. The examining the septum and the valve with the endoscope will give you a better idea than imaging. There is still not conclusive evidence from studies that compared MRIs and CTs with the examination, clinical examination in the clinic to show that imaging is better. A lot of surgeons still do routine CT scans and so on but it's not essential. I'll tell you only time I do imaging, if I suspect artificial implants. So I have patients who come from, uh, from South Korea, for example, 
they can have silastic, and I don't know what was done. I need to know if it's an artificial implant, especially silastic is okay because it's easy to remove if you have to remove. Mid-pore, mid-pore implant, which some people still use, I don't think should be used in the nose because it gets really stuck. If it gives you a good result, it's fine. If you have to revise it, it's very hard to dissect it, and it shows on the scan, so that's why I would, I would do a scan. This, this is exactly the point. And um, another question, uh, this is a, a Chinese colleague, uh, which is asking, uh, would you uh, prefer um, endoscopic assessment during the, the surgery or uh, just before surgery? Yeah, I do a endoscopic assessment for every patient before surgery, yeah, because I want to check uh, the mucosa, if it, any inflammation or polyps or anything, and if the valve is narrow. And it's best to do it in the operation, the outpatients, before surgery. During surgery, you can look again, but I don't routinely look because I've already looked before the operation. That's it. Another question from, from Russia which is asking a, a technical, I guess, uh, um, question, which is, the, which is the role of the keystone area in, uh, in pre-assessment? Uh, okay, the keystone area is the area between the nasal bones and upper lateral cartilages, okay? This is a very important area because if this is weakened, you get collapse of the middle third of the nose and you get problems with appearance, but you also get Inverted V, which is like this, when this cartilage go in like that, and then narrows the valve. The keystone area can be detached because of trauma and because of surgery. So when you palpate in the nose, if you feel step here, and you see this is narrow, means the core keystone area is disrupted. That will help you on the plan for the surgery, because how do you repair this? You have to put grafts to strengthen the upper lateral and to open the, the, the angle between the septum and upper lateral, and the standard way of doing it is a spread a graph. So if you assess the patient, you feel that step here and disruption here, you need to plan spread a graph. Um, another, another two questions, at least, because uh, then we have to stop. Um, the first one, uh, the, the colleague is asking, uh, uh, are you explaining uh, to the patient uh, uh, that she or he will undergo some some kind of massage after surgery and are you instructing them before surgery or after that i don't routinely uh, tell the patient to to do any massage of the nose because there's no uh, clinical evidence it makes a difference but in patients who have very thick skin i do sometimes inject steroids in the supratip area about three weeks after the operation to prevent uh, excessive scarring and polybeak, these patients are to massage this area. This is the only group. I don't routinely ask uh, all the patients to massage. And the, and the last question is, uh, uh, are you performing uh, or are you assessing preoperatively the osteotomies? Yeah, yeah, you're planning your osteotomies when you've seen the patient in the clinic. So for example, the types of osteotomies, if you have a patient who just needs narrowing, you just you could do lateral medial osteotomies only, but if you have a patient who uh, has a very twisted nose, you can plan other like intermediate osteotomies or transverse osteotomies. So it depends what condition the patient is having. So you assess it during the surgery, and there's so many different types of osteotomies you can plan, but they go be in between three or four types in the end: lateral, medial, transverse, or intermediate, and you plan that according to the type of the bone. There's so many variations. This is was just, uh, I think that the essential um, uh, explanation for a preoperative assessment. I would like to thank you again, um, Hashem, for your participation. And I also would suggest our young colleague to uh, follow his uh, instructional courses uh, where he's uh, uh, having part of it. And um, uh, Dr. Hashem Saleh is always present in uh, the juniors, uh, ERS juniors meetings, attending and also doing uh, um, uh, master dissection. So 
so please, uh, juniors, uh, I would like to stress on juniors because I was part of the junior board for the European Rhinology Society, and I am still keep thinking that it's very important for supporting the juniors to be part of dissection courses. Uh, so please, if you want to know more from uh, here, the activity of uh, Dr. Hesham Saleh, please join him and uh, be present for the 2020 European Rhinology Society meeting in Thessaloniki. Thank you again, Hesham. It was a very, Thank you very much. Very good to, to have you here, and I hope to have you for the 2020 segment too. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much. Let's see you. Goodbye. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.